Um, I'm going to talk tonight about feeling outside yourself and how science and art projects can help us to, uh, to do that. Empathy is defined as the feeling of being one with something outside yourself. It's a profound idea, really being able to understand and feel and enter the sphere of another person, of an ecological system, something outside of who we are. And um, when you're a scientist, you know, you tend towards data. And we, one of the many scientists practice by setting a real emotional distance between ourselves and the external world. And we do this in the interest of being objective. But art often emphasizes emotion. And it reduces the distance between us and the other. And when science and art meet, empathy can emerge, which leads to impact on important personal, social, environmental issues. I want to tell you today about three projects that I've been involved in, in which art and science merged, and empathy and impact were outcomes. The first one was a project on coral reefs. Uh, well, it was a dance, a dance project in which coral reefs became predominant. One of the authors of this project, Isabel Cote, and I, and a number of other behavioral ecologists, sat down in a room with a number of dancers from the Link Dance Foundation in Vancouver. And the idea was to just talk and see what might emerge. And Isabel, being an expert on coral reefs, started talking about coral reefs. Uh, she told us a little bit about blanching, this phenomenon where the symbiotic algae in coral reefs get expelled when the pH changes, when the there's pollution, when the water warms, it's a real impact of climate change. And there's no question that science and Isabel have documented this quite a bit through data. But she was talking analytically, telling us the data. And while the data aren't uh, trivial, they're certainly important, nothing was emerging that we could make a dance out of. So I said, asked Isabel, can you just stop here for a minute? Tell us what it's like to float over a coral reef while you're taking data. And essentially what she told us was more like this. Her whole demeanor changed. She went somewhere. She went to that reef. And she described in most beautiful detail the fish and the interactions, how symbiotic and integrative the whole system was. And she used her hands and she was motioning. And those motions became an important part of our dance. This is a scene from Symbiotic. This is the 10 seconds of dance that I have choreographed in my life. <laughs> uh, when we were working with um, with uh, Gail and the Link Foundation, she told us when we were rehearsing, if we ever just feel like doing something on stage, try it, see what happens. And um, before this happened, the two dancers were over there. And I was over here being a scientist, and I was commenting on what the dancers were doing. And I was just stiff and standing there commenting. And they were over there just being beautiful dancers. And I felt incredibly lonely. So I walked over, and I intertwined with the dancers. And it became the signature moment in that piece, because it was about getting outside of yourself and joining with others. It expressed this idea of symbiotic. It expressed the idea of interaction and of becoming one with the other. Something else happened in this dance that really impressed me. It has stayed with me. When we were on stage, we were lit from the front. We could not see the audience. And in fact, opening night, we had no idea whether there even was anybody out there. And we did this dance. It was about 40 minutes long. And when we were done, we came up to the front of the stage for a bow. And the lights came up. And one of those things happens that happens so rarely in performances. The audience was absolutely dead quiet. They didn't clap. They didn't move. There were people with tears streaming down their face. And it just emphasized for me that science is important, that data are important, but that is not how you move people. You can move people through art so much more effectively than science. And it's putting the two together that's really effective. And um, 
that idea of emotion is behind empathy and it's behind um, most of the science communication that I do these days because it's not really about the science alone. The, um, I do work with bees. I actually started out as a marine biologist. I am the world's expert on dominance hierarchies in one particular species of hermit crab, which is not particularly useful anymore in my life. Uh, but I learned a lot from bees. I learned a lot about empathy, work, working with a social insect. First for the bees themselves, then for the environment, then for the people I was working with. And bees being social are really particularly compelling examples of caring for each other and for the community. Uh, and my empathy for bees was augmented and enhanced through collaborations with artists. <laughs> we did a project again with the Link Dance Foundation called Experiments. And I'd like to read you a very short segment from my book. And then I'm going to show you about a one minute video from this piece, Experiments, that's about the B component of what we were doing. My own experience with artists guided me toward exploring the creativity of artists and, science and scientists working together. I took part in a dance project, Experiments, with Gail Lotenberg, founder and director of the Link Dance Foundation. Our objective was to produce a dance performance that explored similarities and differences in how artists and scientists imagine, observe, reflect, hypothesize, and experiment. My interest in experiments was stimulated initially by exploring whether dance might be a useful tool to enliven how we scientists communicate science to a public audience. But the work with dancers and my fellow scientists had a much greater personal impact than I had expected. The biggest surprise was in how movement through dance can create a tangible embodiment of data, giving research papers both an emotional and a physical form. In one section of experiments, I appear in a background video describing a South American experiment with bees we conducted 35 years ago. We took individual worker honeybees of two different races, the aggressive African killer bees and the relatively docile European bees, and put them in each other's hives. When I first saw the dancers in this elegantly choreographed section of experiments, I was overcome with the oddest bodily sensation of being physically immersed in those study hives, decades ago in time and remote in location. I could again feel hundreds of bees crawling on my hands and arms as I removed frames from the hive for observation, achieving a visceral understanding of how the quiet, passive European bees responded to finding themselves in the jacked up world of a killer beehive. I felt rather than thought about the results of this fascinating experiment. Dance had made the intellectual intuitive, taking data from the page and making it experiential. This was a completely unexpected outcome of our collaboration. A scientific paper had become physically embodied through the representational movements of three powerful dancers on stage. Here too, empathy was at the heart of the project, built on deep feelings for the bees expressed between science and dance. Uh, could you maybe put the lights down and run the video? <clears throat> It's really difficult to explain why any particular organism attracts us. Uh, for me, bees attracted me because they were so social. They were so communicative. They are so interactive. Uh, they require each other. They're so dependent on each other in order to survive. And the relationship of bees to their environment is integral to how every ecosystem that we know functions. Uh, bees pollinate. If they didn't pollinate, ecosystems would be dramatically and radically different. But there's another level of why we study something. There's a connection that we make to the natural world. And I have no explanation for why um, it might be bees for me, it might be um, cedar trees for someone else. But the first time I went into a beehive, uh, I knew I was home. <laughs>
Can we have the lights back up? If there is reincarnation, I want to come back as one of those three dancers. <laughs> <laughs> These dance projects were um, all about collaboration. And collaboration, working together for a common purpose, is a primary driver of empathy. I want to tell you about the last and third and last project uh, with a physical artist, Agony at the Dick, a Canadian artist who puts objects into beehives. Um, being Canadian, of course, she put hockey skates in the beehives. <laughs> this is Agonitha, a wonderful woman from uh, Saskatchewan, now lives in Manitoba. Um, she's quite renowned around the world. This is her most famous piece, the wedding dress. Uh, it was a wedding dress that she put in a beehive, well, a giant beehive, and over 10 seasons, the bees built comb around it. It's now in the National uh, Gallery of Canada. Uh, for Agonitha, Collaboration with the bees is key. She has no illusions that bees are doing what she tells them to do, but she values their choices as her collaborators, and her only direction is the objects that she puts in the hive. And it's not surprising, because bees are the ultimate collaborators. They work together towards common purpose. Something like comb building takes thousands of bees to build this beautiful, hexagonal, very consistent comb structures. The individual is important. Individuals. Each individual does something. Uh, here we see a bee exuding flakes of wax from her abdomen, uh, which is the precursor for the comb. Uh, but all the bees get together. They take those flakes. They use their jaws. They use their legs. And they form them into comb with many, many dozens of bees working on each cell. It's all about collaboration. Uh, solitary becomes communal. Here's what Agonitha had to say about working with bees. I began working with honeybees because they're sculptors, because they're the best architects anywhere. They're really the artists. When I put an object into the hive, the honeybees follow the object's contours, close openings, open closures. They create straight lines of comb where I would never have thought possible or necessary. Honeybees have and continue to inspire designers, architects, and artists. They inspire me to collaborate with them because they feed my curiosity. <clears throat> they allow me to experiment, teaching me to think into their box and out of my box. The bees are my muse because they allow me to contemplate, to wonder and reflect on who is this truly mysterious, magical, gift-giving pollinator. Through collaboration, we build empathy. There is no better way to get a sense of the other than to work together towards a common purpose. And this is a primary lesson that I've learned from honeybees and from collaborating with artists about Agonitha, about honeybees. I want to conclude with another very brief reading uh, from Bee Time. This is a quote, uh, a picture rather, of a quilt a woman named Hope Johnson in Vermont uh, makes them. It just beautifully expresses the interactive nature of a hive. And uh, the connection between art and science and empathy for me is strong. Science provides data, but working together with art, it provides the substrate upon which we can learn about each other, express our emotions about each other, and collaborate together. Be art is particularly valuable for those of us in the sciences. We who dwell deeply in data and can lose sight of the imaginary. Life is best engaged in its full spectrum rather than having to choose between the emotional and intellectual sides of our nature. Science demands proof, whereas the artist works happily in ambiguity and feeling. But these different ways of being in the world too rarely coexist. Perhaps every scientific experiment should have a corresponding expression through the arts to deepen and broaden the insights research data can bring to our understanding of the world. Science done well can be as imaginative as art, Soaring beyond description to tell a story, offering a glimpse into the mystery. Thank you very much.